what are some ways we can more effectively plan our IFR cross countries? Hey, M Zero Nation, Jason Shepard here, and you are listening to the IFR, the Instrument Pilot Podcast, brought to you by our brand spanking new and beautiful, but I'm biased, online ground school. Take a two-week free trial of it at m0atrial.com, m0atrial.com. Check it out. See what all the hype is about. I don't like using the word hype. Hype's not a good word. It's not hype. It is just, it is excitement. There is so much love. There is so much science, so much effort, so much dedication that has gone into this. So scratch the word hype, m 0 Nation. I didn't just say that. Scratch the word hype. Um, there is a lot of love that's gone into this. I hope you will check it out. I know you've seen some of the amazing testimonials and what everyone's been talking about. See it for yourself though. Just don't take my word for it. I do have a very, very strong bias. I want you to love it. M0atrial.com to check it out and learn more. I want to talk to you today in our short time together. My goal, by the way, whether you're listening on, on iTunes, Audible, YouTube, Facebook, and I hope you listen to all of them, subscribe and follow and like and whatever it is across all those channels. I try to keep these short and concise. And that, that's, that, there's many purposes behind that. I'm, um, you know, I don't think we need a whole hour long podcast. We can do this in short little bite-sized chunks. And I am someone who is always on the go. Uh, I love what I call net time. NET is an acronym for no extra time. I personally use audiobooks and podcasts as my NET time. I am the nerd who is at the gym. Um, in fact, right now I'm listening to a, a Warren Buffett biography um, audiobook. Like that is, that is how I work out. I listen to the history of Warren Buffett. And, and I, I'm always doing different little things like that. And you clearly are cut from the same cloth because, well, you're doing that as well. And so when you see me running down the road, training for the next ultra marathon or, or at the gym or something like that, it's listening to something. So I applaud you for doing that as well. And my goal, like I said, is to keep these short to honor your time because your time is very, very precious. And we just are very thankful for you to spend some of it with us. So in that short period of time, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to speak quickly. I might be a little verbose in some point, so reel me in there, about planning an IFR cross-country. And I need to give you some homework, too, because as of this recording, uh, this is going to come out the second week, I believe, of October. Some of you are starting to think about winter. The Private Pilot podcast was all about winter flying. It was all about winter flying. So you may be past private pilot, but it would behoove you, it would benefit you to go back and listen to that. It's about 20 minutes. Listen to the winter flying episode. It transcends certificates and ratings. Just because it's on the private pilot podcast does not mean it's beneath you. It is right in your wheelhouse, actually. To parlay off of that, let's now talk about planning that IFR cross country. And here's what I'm not going to do. I don't want to get into... This is how you calculate top of climb. I have a great video on that on YouTube. This is how we do time, you know, fuel, speed, distance, uh, wind correction angles. I have great videos on that, not only on YouTube, but all of these inside the online ground school as well. Again, we are here to serve you with that. I want to share today really five out of the box ideas that don't make it on a nav log that don't make it in traditional ground school. They're certainly in the M0A online ground school, but if for some reason, and it doesn't bother me one bit, if for some reason you used a competitor or you went somewhere else, or I don't even like the word competition, there's no such thing as competition, we all have the same goal of making safer, smarter pilots. If you used somebody else for your ground studies, I have no problem with that. We are, we are happy, we are stable, we are fruitful, we are blessed here. Don't you worry about us. I just want to help fill in some gaps just in case. And that's not accusing anyone else of giving you gaps in your training. These are just some out of the box ideas that others may not have. And the first is this, and I actually did an in-flight coffee about this in, or maybe it was a webinar. No, I think it was in-flight coffee in, in September-ish. I have to go back and look. Do you know the difference between the composite radar versus the lowest tilt? Do you know the difference between the composite radar versus lowest tilt? I apologize. I was just looking at my notes. I know where I said it. Private podcast last month, I talked about this briefly. 
Do you know the difference between the composite radar and the lowest tilt? You see, do a fun experiment for me right now. Grab your iPad, or if you're listening to this on your iPhone, or really, it doesn't matter what device you're using, wherever you get your aviation weather, I'm just speaking for flight language, I use for flight, I am not sponsored by for flight, I don't desire to be sponsored by for flight, we are just doing A-OK, -okay, buying our own subscriptions, and that way I am free to talk about whatever, whatever I want, the good, the bad, the ugly, right? In for flight, Find a spot in the country right now that has just a little bit of weather. Find a spot in the country that has a little bit of weather. Look at it with the composite radar. Study it right now. While you listen to my voice, you can leave this open if you're on Audible or iTunes right now. I don't know how YouTube or Facebook, it might cut me off. But while you're looking at that, really studying it, really studying it, Study the borders. How far out does it go to? Check all, where is it most intense? Check all that. Now, don't move your screen. Leave your screen exactly where it is. Go up to the layers, and now switch to a lowest tilt radar. What do you see? How different is it, the composite versus the lowest tilt? My guess, and I am not with you right now, I promise, I'm not creeping over your shoulder, that'd be weird. My bet is it's very, very different. And I don't care if you're listening to this 10 years down the road. It doesn't matter. Well, I guess technology could change, so it does matter. But as of this recording in 2021, I guarantee you're seeing something very, very different. Why is that? Composite is showing all moisture in the... Well, no, 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 take that back. Composite is showing all possible precipitation that is in the air. Lowest tilt is showing rain that's actually falling to the ground. That's why there's such a difference. That's why you could be green on the composite radar and have it just be cloudy where you're at and not actually raining. The rain's up there. It's in the clouds. It's, it's ready. When it gets heavy enough, it will fall. And then it'll show on the lowest tilt as well. Lowest tilt is showing precipitation that's making it towards the ground. And this can get you in trouble. Because so often, and I have heard this used before, and I do not like the statement, if it's green on the radar, I can go right through it. I don't like that statement. That is a statement that gets you hurt. That's a statement that's going to be, end up in the NTSB reports one day. It was only green on the radar. If you get so used to looking at the composite radar, and, oh, it's green, I don't even get wet when I fly through there, it's great. And then one day, it's green on composite and green is on lowest tilt, and you end up flying into some nasty embedded thunderstorms and don't even know it. You get yourself hurt with that. The other aspect of this, and I'm still on point one right now, the other aspect of this is, what's the weather source? Let me give you an example. In 2-3 Mike Zulu, our beloved Cessna 172, I have two independent ADSB sources. I use the Stratus, then I have the onboard ADSB which means I get two different weather radars. But that same data from the onboard ADSB is sent to the Dynon. The same data is sent to the Avidyne. And then the Stratus ADSB data is sent to my iPad. It's the same weather. It's the same cell. And it is painted so differently. Allow me to explain. The Dynon, I've talked to, to uh, Mike at Dynon, there's amazing, amazing people, and I couldn't recommend Dynon certified um, more highly. But I've talked to them about this. It's my belief that Dynon overpaints weather. What is pink, meaning the highest and nastiest intensity on my Dynon, is just shown as yellow on the Avidyne or red on ForeFlight, right? Nobody paints the same. They all paint the intensities differently. This is why you can't have the blanket statement of, if it's green on the radar, I'm good, or even, gosh, more audacious, if it's yellow on the radar, I'm good. Because is it yellow on the Dynon or is it yellow on ForeFlight? Because the intensities can be so different, you can't have these blanket level of statements. And then by the way, do you know and trust your weather source that greatly? You know our weather data? Eight minutes is considered fast receipt 
of the weather? Eight minutes. Receiving radar data is considered fast when it's eight minutes old. If you're being one of those um, cowboys or cowgirls that's out there scud running trying to find holes in weather, and I, I doubt that's you because those kinds of people don't listen to podcasts like this, if I could be so bold. I know that's not you. But there are people out there that eight minutes could be the difference between life and death. The hole was there, and then it was gone. And there's NTSB reports about it. In Aviation Master, the book, I talk about one. Anyways, how quickly are you getting your weather radar? I love having two ADSB sources because I often get them uh, at different times. I can cut that eight minutes down to like four minutes. Not that I'm ever cutting weather that close. I just like more real up-to-date stuff. What about XM weather? That's also delayed. I've seen that delayed up to 18 minutes before, and it was considered fast. XM, ADSB, true radar, right? What's true radar is great, but it's just painting what's in front of you. What about what's behind you? What about what's beyond what the radar can see? What am I flying into? There's so many aspects to that. And I told you I was gonna make this a short podcast, and that was just point number one. Point number two, I like to look at cloud heights. I like to look at the height of clouds. You used to have to use the radar summary chart to do this now, and you can just do it very, very easily in flight. How high are these clouds? These same clouds that are producing green on your composite radar, they may only be at 8,000 feet. They may just be a little stratus layer. I'm not too worried about that. In fact, that's probably very stable air, great instrument flying. If that same green, which also has yellow in it, has tops up to 30,000 feet, that gets my attention. That's a serious thunderstorm. That is a towering cumulonimbus cloud. I've seen as high as 40. I've seen as high as 50,000. You avoid those like, like it's the plague, seriously. You want nothing to do with that. So another way, it's one thing to look at intensities and say it's green, it's yellow, it's red, it's pink on my radar. It's another thing to look at the cloud heights and see how much power does this thing pack? Because if it's pushing into the 20s and growing into the 30s, 30,000s is what I'm talking about, this guy or this gal, however you want to, whatever pronoun you want to give that cloud, it's gonna pack a punch, and you must be ready to avoid such. Next, speaking of avoiding, is what are your personal minimums? I don't need to spend much time here because I've harped on this so greatly. You all know this, but let me say it again just because for somebody out there, this may be their very first podcast, their very first interaction with M0A.com, they don't even know who this Jason guy is. I teach hard set personal minimum numbers. I will not go flying if, the clouds are less than blank. Notice the vernacular, notice the words chosen there. The clouds are less than blank. Some people say, I will not go flying if the ceiling is less than blank. And the definition of a ceiling is the lowest broken or overcast layer. And that's all well and good for an FAA definition. But who has ever seen a few layer become a scattered layer, become a broken layer, become an overcast layer? If you haven't seen it, you will. That's how mother nature works. And it works the opposite direction too sometimes, but I find it going the other direction more often towards overcast. I will not go flying if the clouds are less than blank. I will not go flying if the visibility is less than blank. You can hurt yourself here, by the way. I won't go flying if the visibility is less than six. Have you ever seen six miles? If you're a VFR only pilot, you shouldn't be flying in that. In fact, have you even seen nine miles of visibility? Because you get so spoiled when you read the METAR, it says visibility 10. And you get up and you fly and you're in Florida and you can see the Atlantic Ocean, the Gulf of Mexico at the same time. And you go, man, 10 miles, awesome. No, the visibility could be unlimited. The visibility could be 12, the visibility could be 10. METAR just shows up to 10. A TAF's even worse, it just shows visibility greater than six. Have you ever seen truly six miles? Have you ever seen nine miles? You wouldn't be happy flying in visibility like that. It's crummy, crummy visibility. Lastly, I will not go flying if the winds are greater than blank. I've had some people add, I will not go flying if the crosswind component is greater than blank, and they add a fourth one there as well. Point number four. So, so first point, know your radar. Second point, study cloud heights. Third point, you have to have personal minimums. Fourth point, 
always have an alternate even when it's not required. I know there's, there's beautiful rules, right? Oh, an hour before, an hour after, two, and I know the one, two, three rule. I know all these things as to when an alternate is required. I'm here to tell you that in my book, which takes the far aim and makes it even more stringent, I'm sorry, but it keeps you safe. I think you should always have an alternate. You should always know where you want to go. You should never just plan you're going to fly from here to here. You should always have a plan in between. And what I like, let's say I'm flying from Ocala in Florida, I'm in central Florida, which is north of Orlando, near Gainesville, to Orlando. Let's use Orlando. Everyone knows where Disney is, right? That's where I'm flying. I like to have an alternate along my route of flight, something like Leesburg or Apopka or Umatilla, if you're really familiar with the area. I like to have an alternate along my route of flight because here's the mistake people make is they keep flying and assume the weather's going to get better and it so often doesn't. If you have your point right there, you can look and say, this weather's not getting any better. I'm dropping off here in Leesburg. I'm dropping off here in Apopka, whatever it is. And you also have, if for some reason you say, ah, oh, I'm not going to stop at Leesburg, I'll keep going on. And it still gets worse. You always have the option to turn right back around on the exact same route. And you know the weather's a little bit better behind you, hopefully, in theory. Right? Mother Nature's funny sometimes. I don't like these crazy alternates 30 miles to my west. What if the weather's coming from the west? Or, you know, 20 miles to my, I don't like that. If it's, if it's off course from you, I mean. 20 miles to my left, 20 miles to my right. I don't like that. Try to keep it on your route. And having the alternate on your route allows you to say, you know, if I get to here and I'm tired, if I get to here and I'm this, or whatever it is, I know I can stop. I've got this. The last thing is I have something called the three hour rule. Point five is the three hour rule. Two through Mike Zulu, according to the POH, holds four and a half hours of fuel. I have never tested that theory. I've never run the tanks dry, you know, praise God. I have the three hour rule, which means from the moment I start the engine, the timer starts, now the transponder does it for me. You used to have to do it manually. I start the timer all the way to the moment I am taxi on, on landing, on taxi in from landing to the FBO, to where the line guy or the line gal is directing me in, to where they give me the big X to shut down, my clock better not say more than three hours which really means I'm planning about two and a half hour legs, 15 minutes of taxi on either side with some start time and clearance time and everything else on either side of those. The three hour rule. Now you can adjust this to your airplane. A buddy of mine has a Bonanza uh, and when it's full, it holds six hours of fuel. So he uses the, the four hour rule. Um, when it's to the tabs, he uses the three hour rule. And, and, and you gotta adapt it to your airplane. The goal is you wanna be landing rolling up to the FBO with about an hour and a half of fuel left. And you know what? I've been thankful for the three hour rule a few times. I've shared with some of you before and I share it in Aviation Mastery, the book. I wanna say I diverted eight times once flying from Ann Arbor, Michigan, trying to get to Louisville, Kentucky, ended up somewhere around Cincinnati, I wanna say. Um, eight times I had to divert. It was to the point where literally the controller was saying, at the time it was 7159 Quebec, 7159 Quebec, uh, how, uh, safe fuel status, this is on like diversion number four. Oh, we got about, you know, we got about two hours of fuel. And they're like, you hear the relief in their voice. They were thinking like, usually when someone's diverted four times, it's getting pretty close. It's not the case for us. We were, we were good. We have the three hour rule. It makes flight plans so much easier. I just look for two and a half hour legs. I don't need to push it. You know, my bladder can't make it that far anyways. My, my lady I'm flying with wants to get out. Magda, she wants to get out and stretch her legs. If I'm flying with the kids, they certainly need to stop. It just works out better for everybody. The three hour rule. Figure out what that rule is for you. What's going to be your landing with an hour and a half of fuel remaining, literally pulling up to the FBO. That's what I want you to think about. So let's recap here because I'm already at the, almost the 20 minute mark. Know your radar. Know the difference between composite and lowest tilt. Know that each, ra each app, each software paints the weather differently. XM, ADS-B even. Two, look at cloud heights. 
Look at cloud heights, the nasty guys that are pushing 20, 30, 40, certainly 50,000 feet. Avoid those. Three, you must have hard set personal minimum numbers. Four, always have an alternate even if it's not required. And five, use the three hour rule. And Missouri Nation, I told you this would be a little bit different. Planning an IFR cross country, gosh, this could be planning a VFR cross country too for that matter, couldn't it? It's anything, it's any cross country. Thank you for making these some of the most listened to aviation podcasts on iTunes and on Audible. It is just such, it doesn't feel like we have a job. It is so incredible to serve you all, the M0 Nation. I mean it when, you, when I say you all are just like our family. So listen, I'm gonna let you all get back to enjoying your net time, no extra time with whatever you're doing right now. And maybe put in the comments on YouTube or Facebook. What do you do when you listen to the podcast? Are you driving? Are you at the gym? Are you walking the dog? I, I'm curious now. What are you doing when you're listening to these podcasts? Maybe you're at work. I won't tell your boss. Don't worry. Thank you so much for everything you do. Thank you for your reviews. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for your subscriptions. Everything. Remember, m0atrial.com. Have a blessed, amazing, outstanding rest of your day. And most importantly, remember that a good pilot is always learning. Have a great day, everybody. I'll see you.